Hello, hello. It's Nayetta, your host of the Let Kids Play podcast, here with another wonderful episode. And today we have our special guest, Ines. Um, I'm excited for this interview because um, she's a multilingual specialist. And I just think it's important. And I want to um, share with you all how she feels it's important uh, for your kids to be diverse in language. Um, and how it impacts the world and how it can change the world. And I won't take steal from her thunder. I'll let her introduce um, you to introduce herself to you all. So, Inez, tell us about yourself or give us a little bit about you. Hoy estoy hablando sobre las cosas que son en cuáles son importantes uh, para los niños en cómo se multilingüe. Es importante porque podemos ser um, más cariñosos uh, si tenemos más idiomas y podemos hacer más amistades. So I am Ines. I work with parents in teaching them how to have a multilingual aspect to their, how to add one to their homeschool program. And a lot of parents say, well, I don't homeschool. I send them to a regular school and they can learn that there. But I like to let them know that if you're actively raising your child, you are homeschooling them. It might not be an academic way of homeschooling, but you're teaching them something unless you're just yelling at them all the time and you're not like trying to teach. <laughs> like you're not being intentional. I agree because um, some people get caught up in the homeschool and it's not necessarily like, like you said, the academic part. If you're active, you're teaching your kids every day, every second. There's a life lesson in there somewhere. You're teaching them how to cook. And I think the language aspect is um, important because other cultures do it. Like their kids may go to school for the academics and then they come home and they're still learning, 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 learning. Um, while, you know, our culture tends to slack off a little bit. So I love the introduction. <laughs> my son is learning um well he learned to sign um his name so he's really excited that i'm interviewing you so i just had to throw that in there he's 10 so he's excited um so he can't wait to see the interview but how did you get into um the most bilingual aspect or field and niche were was it something that you were taught when you were growing up or was it something that you got into as an adult when you had kids like what what changed or what triggered this in your life for you to start honestly i love this question because i get asked it in all of the languages so far i'm only up to four languages um, but I am going to acquire more. I have English, of course, Spanish, sign language, and French. Okay. French is my weakest one because I don't get to use it often. But I um, started learning Spanish first. I started learning Spanish back in middle school. And it, it changed my perspective because the first year I started learning, I'm sorry, my brain is on like hands. is trying You're to... You're fine. I love it. <laughs> I was picking it okay. up. <laughs> so back in middle school, I was in seventh grade when I started learning Spanish. And then in eighth grade, my Spanish teacher told me I was doing so well that she sent me to a competition that only two people for each school could go to. And I was one of the two people. And I was like, wow, I'm actually good at something. And like the, up until that point, I slept in all of the Spanish classes all of them and but i think that's one thing that made it work is because i was sleeping and it was going in naturally without me like actively trying to learn it 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 became like subconscious it's like when uh this sounds bad i'm a pk i spent a lot of time in church growing up so like i would go to church and then like i would fall asleep because we in here for like six seven hours like yeah. for baptist baptist so like we're in here for hours and then by the time the service is over, like, I don't have the energy for that. I didn't even eat breakfast. So I fell asleep. 
And my parents would ask me like, oh, what did they preach about today? And I'd be like, uh, and I'll pull certain words out of something I heard during my sleep. So taking that over into my Spanish classes and falling asleep, I didn't feel safe at home growing up. Um, I grew up in an abusive situation where I was bullied at home. I was bullied at school. I was bullied when I left school in the after school program. So I was bullied all over the place. But when I did feel safe, it was when I was in my classroom and I was with my teacher. And so my teachers would speak Spanish and, well, they talk about all the other stuff. It's just Spanish was the one that was like the most fun. Like yeah. there's food associated with this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love tacos. I always love tacos. So I was like, well, the people who make tacos speak Spanish. So why not learn how to ask for the tacos in their language? And so when I got to high school, I was in the International Baccalaureate program. Are you familiar with what that is? No. Okay. So the IB program, the way I describe it is like AP and honors and college prep. It's very stressful. It's, it's like legit college prep. And okay. for us, we took it in high school. So we had to take, a, we would pick a minor. So, or a six subject, that's what they called it, a six subject. So my six subject was French. So I started French in about 10th grade. Yeah, so 10th grade. So at this point I had already been learning Spanish for three years, but also in that same year, I started learning how to sign. And this was just an excuse to not go home. I didn't wanna be home. So on Saturdays, I would go to the library and I would take ASL lessons because I just needed an excuse to not be at my house. And unfortunately, it started like that, but it, it really changed my life. I was... Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Started... No, you're fine, you're fine. I just <laughs> want to be clear. Um, so in 10th grade, you started French. And then in, that, in the midst of that, you were also taking the classes at the library for ASL. Okay, okay. Okay, so then I started being able to make friendships with all kinds of people. I was a football manager, so I was making friendships with the athletes, the people in the IB program, people who spoke Spanish, people who spoke French, people who used sign language. So then these are five different groups. So then it took it went from me feeling alone all the time and being bullied all the time to having a community unlike any other I've ever seen. Mm, okay. I like that. I like, so a traumatic experience actually started this beautiful thing for you. Okay. And back in high school. So fast forward to you um, becoming a mom. Um, what were your thoughts as far as when you, um, when you had your daughter and thinking like, I really need to, because it, it came from a traumatic experience for you, but for your daughter, it's not creating that traumatic experience. So how did you turn this into a beautiful thing to incorporate with your child and her learning? Well, while I was in college, I wanted to be a trilingual interpreter for the deaf. And this, was, this is someone who knows another language, ASL in English. So I wanted to do that. But then one of my professors said, there will never be enough interpreters. And I figured, how do we solve the problem of the shortage that happens? Because my friends are deaf. So like, how do I fix this for kids who are growing up and they're feeling alone like I did? So I generally connect with a lot of deaf individuals because we both experience what it felt like to be alone and isolated and depressed, especially as a child because this can have such a detrimental effect on your psyche and the way you approach things, like you may approach things with fear or a lack mindset. Whereas when people grow up and they feel safe, they, they're like, oh, I can just make more money or I can do this because they don't have those kind of things inhibiting them from becoming their best selves. So when I was in high school, I mean, in college, an opportunity arose for me to become a, they just wanted someone to teach sign language, but they were already teaching Spanish at this private school. And I figured since they're teaching Spanish, why not take English out of the equation altogether 
and teach sign language from Spanish. So these kids mm -hmm. were already taking Spanish from birth or however long they were at their school. And they were like, not, it wasn't sticking. The, okay. like the way the teacher was teaching the Spanish, it's not them, it's just they were doing the best they could because they're a native Spanish speaker. Whereas when you learn Spanish as a second or third language, you learn tips and tricks that help you remember, oh, this is associated with this. And in English, it sounds like this. So yeah. connecting that because of my personal experience as a Spanish language learner and knowing that American Sign Language, I'm sorry, I'm nerding out. This is this is right You're up my alley. Fine. I love it. <laughs> You're fine. So, in learning American Sign Language, you find out that it comes more so from French Sign Language than British Sign Language or English, because it's not English on your hands. It's a complete different language, but it is often translated into English. So a lot of hearing people assume that it's just English being signed, and that's not what it is. You're actually translating basically from French and Martha's, Martha Vineyard sign language to get to what we have now as ASL. So I was teaching them ASL from Spanish. So all of our lessons would be me speaking Spanish and they have to match the concept in ASL. But kids need to play. That's their love language. That's how they communicate. That's how they connect. That's how they learn. So kids have to play. So instead of us sitting down and saying, oh, this is how you say something in English, and this is what it looks like in Spanish, and this is what it looks like in sign language, we play games. The yeah. whole time I was teaching, I was playing games. So I had more than 200, well, I had 150 students there. And then afterwards, I had about 50 students, or well, a little bit more. So more than 200 alumni. And... Every single one, I can't, I, even with behavioral issues, even with disabilities, every single one benefited from learning sign language. And not only them, all of the people in their county or their areas that knew sign language that are kids, that can grow up knowing that someone down the street knows their language. So those kids don't grow up feeling isolated. And that was what inspired me to take this route. I know this is a long roundabout to get to the point, but I miss those kids so much. Like when the pandemic happened and we were moving back home to Atlanta, I asked my husband, he's my husband now, I was like, can we have a kid? I don't like, I'm going to miss my students so much. And instead of <laughs> us where being you depressed, to Atlanta. I was close to Florida. I like, I don't like saying South Georgia because that sounds gross to me. Just being honest, I'm a black woman in America. South Georgia sounds disgusting to me. <laughs> but no offense to the people who live there, just saying that I lived there and all of the traumatic experiences I had living there as a black woman made it hard for me to be happy about living there. I met my husband there, so I'm grateful for my son there. <laughs> I met a lot of beautiful people there. I'm grateful for those, but I did have to experience a lot of stuff living out there. So I like to say North Florida. <laughs> okay, North Florida, got it. <laughs> it sounds like a vacation when you say North Florida. <laughs> got um, it. So we had our baby and like from day one, uh, well, as soon as on the app, it, uh, one of the pregnancy apps says, uh, your baby has ears, your baby can hear your voice now. I started speaking in Spanish to her. I was pregnant, so like she was going to hear my voice all the time. So I might as well, yes. if we're alone, I might as well speak Spanish. And then from the day she was born, she's been learning to sign. At 91 days old, she signed back. She signed, yes. And oh. then about three months later, at six months old, is when we started having conversations. So I have no idea, honestly, when her voice started coming out, because we were already communicating long before I could hear what she was saying. Yes, I love that. And a lot of people don't understand that signing to me is the best language to teach your kids first. Um, I did sign it with my kids just because my husband could not understand toddler language at all. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I saw 
helped the kids to sign just so that when they were with dad, they could tell him what they needed and he understood. So I kind of taught both of them, I guess. So I love that she started signing at six months. So I want to go back real quick. Um, when you were teaching the kids in North Florida. Because <laughs> <laughs> play is important. Um, what games were you playing with them to teach them? Because I don't want it to be skipped over. You were teaching them. So these were kids that knew English, but they were learning Spanish and ASL at the same time. So what games did you use to incorporate that? And what age okay. group were these? Were the kids? What ages? Each age group has different games, even adults. So I don't teach now, I don't teach sign language in Spanish anymore. Uh, the deaf community spoke up about how they're tired of hearing people basically taking money from their pockets for stealing their language and teaching it. I no longer teach the language because I didn't see it as an issue before, but now that I am aware, I teach the value of effective communication. And so I teach, how to add this aspect, the multilingual aspect to your homeschool program using games that we already know or something you have around the house because language happens in any room you are with another person. So you can be at the library and you gotta be quiet and you need something all the way over there, but there's somebody standing right there who can bring it to you. Just being able to communicate with someone across the room without yelling is just magical to me. Like. ASL is so beautiful. So I no longer teach the language, but I do teach the games. So that's a part of what I teach the parents. One game I really absolutely love is a colors game. Because if they're gonna learn their languages anyway, like if they're gonna learn English and you're gonna teach them their colors, you're gonna teach them their numbers, you're gonna teach them how to read, you might as well teach them in multiple languages at the same time. So you understand that they know the concept more than knowing this is red, but if they know this is red, they might just associate this one thing as being red. They yep. might not realize that red is the concept of what this looks like, not necessarily this is red. This is a pentagon. This a pentagon has five surf, I mean, five sides on it. So this can be described with several salient features and that's fine but what's most important is they know the concept of what the red is so one game i really love to play this is the easiest game to get started with i call it yo busco so since i no longer since i no longer teach sign language in spanish what i do is i point you in the right direction for resources so with all of the resources on YouTube University, you can go in ASL colors and then learn your colors. And then you will come to me and I'll teach you how to play a game that teaches you how to help your kids clean up. So you would say, yo busco amarillo. Which one of these is amarillo? Qual? And then they would have to pick if this is amarillo or this is amarillo. Amarillo means yellow. Yeah. So then they would pick up amarillo and they would clean up only yellow toys. So this is good for colorful blocks. This is good if their room is messy. This is good for a big classroom, small classroom. This is good on a playground. I like, I love doing this on a playground because there are so many things that, oh, yo busco amarillo, they'll go touch amarillo. Yeah. Everybody has to go touch something that's yellow. And you have like DS, nueve, ocho, and you count mm -hmm. down backwards in Spanish for them to practice the numbers. They don't realize that you're counting in a pattern that helps them to learn their numbers, but they're focused on the yellow. The counting comes naturally later. So that's one of my favorite games. You, uh, Yo Busco is kind of like I spy, but hands on, and it can be active. Um, you can do, I mean, basically any of the games you played as a kid. Can I tell you about my favorite one? Yes, yes. I love that this is like <laughs> speaking my love language because all of it is play. Kids learn best when they're using their hands and they're playing because it's like, they say kids are sponges, but they really absorb it when they play. So let's let's hear your favorite game because I like your Busco already, so. <laughs> your Busco works for all ages, but this one is for older kids. So for, I think these were the, 
I think the youngest kid in this group was seven because I did all of the classrooms at this private school. So like homeschooling my daughter honestly is harder than teaching all of the different kids in their different classrooms. Cause I, when I, when I was done, I was done. Yeah. I didn't have to go back and like be mom because homeschooling, there's a very fine line between teacher and mom or teacher and parent. Cause sometimes homeschoolers are grandparents or aunts and uncles, but for, it's so much harder to homeschool because everything is a lesson. But when you have, when you add the languages to it, it makes it more fun. It's exhausting. It takes more time. It takes more patience. But yeah. the results, I have a two and a half year old who is complete in sentences at a much higher age level. I can't even put an age on her and because it's beyond a number. It, she understands. Like, this morning, she said, mommy, the mirror is, is wet. You need to dry it off. I said, how did the mirror get wet? She said, you took a shower and then the water. And she explained condensation <laughs> yeah. at two and a half years old. Like other babies around or other toddlers around her age are saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and yeah. you don't understand. Like I absolutely hate crying babies because it's the least effective way to communicate. Yeah. And the words. there's so much guessing. And all the parents are always saying, use your words, use your words. They might not have those words yet to express it. So giving them sign language makes it so much easier for you to understand, oh, the baby isn't hungry. The baby doesn't need to be changed. The baby doesn't want to be held. The baby's back is itching. <laughs> <laughs> but my daughter has eczema. This is very important for me to know. Like. Her back is itching, but even parents who have kids with allergies, like my daughter is allergic to everything, basically. She's allergic to beans, dairy, eggs, nuts, soy, wheat, and possibly fish. So she's allergic to so many things. If she's yeah. having an allergic reaction, she may be feeling it and I can't see it. I need yeah. her to tell me that her throat hurts. I need her to tell me that her head hurts or whatever so that I can give her what she needs. And using her hands may be working better than a throat that's closed up because there was yep. maybe a peanut and stuff. So just teaching her how to communicate and advocate for herself is important, but also it gives her the ability to help other people stand up for themselves because I needed that. So I had to give her the ability to feel safe early so she can help others who may be in it when she grows up. I I love. That. I never did tell you about the game. Oh my gosh! I you're so fine. Excited. You're fine. I I, I love that because important. Like what you just touched on is pretty much a life or death situation. But having your kids being effective communicators at an early age is important because we have adults that aren't effective communicators. Like sometimes I have an issue articulating what I need to get out. So teaching them at a young age and teaching starts at home is mentally exhausting i homeschool two out of three so i understand completely <laughs> about the homeschool is mentally exhausting but like you said the results and the rewards of it is so beneficial it's just a bit i call it a bittersweet roller coaster because <laughs> you know you want to do it well you don't necessarily want to do it you have to do it <laughs> as an essential part to change the world and change your kids environment. So um, tell us about the game and then I have a question I wanna ask you. Okay, so the game I like to play, uh, I think it's called Werewolf or something in the real world, I don't know. I played it one time at a party when I was in college and I thought, oh, this is fun. You have a hunter, you have a wolf, you have townspeople, you have somebody else, I don't know. I make this up like I, I make up games because kids don't like necessarily sticking to the rules. So I make up the rules. So <laughs> if it's a large group of kids, we like if it's a small group of kids, we may be on a boat and everyone has a job or a task and I match it to them. There's a stargazer. There's someone who can get off and be a pirate with me. Like I drive the boat. I'm the captain, but <laughs> I have no captain. The co-captain, I have a navigator. So like the, this game works for smaller groups. So this one is up to like eight kids. But when, when I had 17 to 23 kids, one time I was on a playground and it was me and 50 something kids. 
and I had all of them stop playing when I did this. This is the sign for hold on. If you see, like, if I do this, the whole playground shuts down. Little kids, big kids, and in the middle, they shut down. And it's like, it's it's like a power I didn't know I needed. Like, <laughs> like kids can get loud. Yeah, it can be numbers. overwhelming. <laughs> yes, it can be so overwhelming. But being able to do this, it's like when you were in school and the teacher would go either this or they'll go like this or it's something that everybody had to get quiet. It's, it's the same thing, but it's more effective because this means hold on. It's not your turn to go yet. But then when I let it go, it's your turn. So everybody has to freeze so I can say what I need to say. And then we can go back to playing when it's done. And then when they see this, they're like, oh, back to business. But they understood what I was stopping them for. So when I had the kids, it was like 17 to 23 kids. It was just, we're going to go with a large group. I had each of them sit in different little spots. There was like a lot of hula hoops. So everybody sat in their own hula hoop. And then everybody closed their eyes. And then I would pick two people to be a wolf. And then they would have to go eat other people, like eat townspeople. And so everybody would close uh, close their eyes. And then when the wolves went and sat down, then they had to, um, everybody had to guess who they thought were the wolves and who got who got eaten. But no one could use their voice. They could only fingerspell the names of their peers. And so everyone would be like, oh, I think maybe Jamie, this is a fake name. I think name, maybe Jamie is the wolf. And he ate, um, I don't know, Alec, I don't know, fake names. So, and he ate this person. And so people would guess, but they're practicing their finger spelling skills. Yeah. But when, they, when they're guessing, they have to come in front of everyone. So everyone else, they can't use their mouth at all. So they would finger spell. And then everyone else would read the finger spelling. And if they spelled their name, they would stand up and say yes or no, whether or not they were the wolf or got eaten. That's focus. You have them very focused, like seriously, critical thinking focus, because they have to make sure that they don't miss the letter that they're spelling to make sure it's their name. I love that. I love that. <laughs> On top it gets of vicious. It gets language. really vicious. Kids are mean. <laughs> Kids are mean because they, they'll eat their best friend on them. <laughs> especially with that age group to seven to 10 that that age group <laughs> i i get it okay so i want to ask i don't want to ask the question i was going to ask i want to continue with the conversation so um your daughter she's two and a half can she sign to other people outside of mom she she teaches people uh i was in like okay so i no longer teach like i'm not accepting new students but i did have a commitment to students before everything happened with the deaf community speaking up so i these people became my responsibility i can't just hold on, hold leave on. them i'm sorry hold on i don't i don't mean to interrupt but this is your second time saying it. so speak on what do you mean when you say the deaf community is speaking up, are they speaking up saying that they don't want people that's not deaf doing the AS, teaching the ASL language? That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh, that's- But that's, before this happened, I was already committed to students. And right. so I'm, I'm a woman of my word. So when I say I wanna do something, I'm gonna do something. Cause not only was I teaching them how to sign, I was teaching them Spanish. So I can't just, throw them to another teacher who only teaches sign language because there's a Spanish aspect. And then if we're not teaching the same thing, it's just, no, it's, I don't mm. want to make this stressful. That's why I use games because I make it where it's not stressful. So I was working with one of my students recently. I've been working with her for three years since 2020. And my daughter wasn't even born yet. I was pregnant when I started working with this student. And now she was, uh, she was like, no, this is how you do that. Like she was teaching my two and a half year old. She, she got on my lap and she does that in the middle of lessons randomly. Cause sometimes when I'm teaching at the house, sometimes I'm at the office, but when I'm at the house, she will just jump in my lap and say, no, 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 this is how you do it. She was like this, look at my bead on my hair. This is Blanco. Is this one, what color is this? 
that's Rosado, okay? And she got <laughs> she got the attitude, everything. Two and a half years old. I mean. love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it because they 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 comprehend way more than we get them credit for. Um, the kids are way smarter than we get them credit for. Like you said, she she's learned three three languages and she's two and a half, and it also helps with her traveling and things like that. So that's okay. So that's what I want to ask. So, what are the benefits? I guess the top because there's so many benefits. What are the top three benefits? of a mom at home, homeschooling, under five, teaching their kids multiple languages? For me, number one is there is a deaf kid in your area who's waiting to meet you. Um, so they're waiting to meet your kid and, and meeting your kid and knowing your kid speaks or communicates using their language, where whether it's sign language or Spanish, French, German, whatever, knowing there's a peer that is communicating in their language who doesn't necessarily use it as their first language you get them a new friend outside of family and it helps them feel less alone when they're in new places so it allows them to make friends so benefit number one it allows them to make friends i was at in this last year my birthday was yesterday so whoop, whoop. happy <laughs> birthday Thank you. Thank you. So in this last year, God has moved me out of my being nervous about everything with the pandemic and being a germaphobe and having a kid. God has been moving me out of that level of fear into a, an aura of confidence. And so in this last year, I, I was in the room, so to speak, with uh, over 100,000 people in different venues. So 20,000 here for InvestFest, uh, 40,000 at Woman Evolve in Texas, and then 40,000 at one music fest, like I've and 200 in a networking event. So I've been in a room with a lot of people, but anytime you know sign language, you can make a friend. I made friends in all three of those places. I, in those large crowds where other people were feeling scared because of crowd mentality, I've connected with people and now we're friends. Like, like you make family, you don't necessarily make friends, you make family. Um, so that's benefit number one. Of course, traveling. I absolutely love to travel. There are so many places I would like to go. But it, number three is important because we got to build those relationships with other people in our communities, even if they don't look like us, even if they don't communicate like, like us. We have to build those relationships because our world is depending on us to have these conversations for our kids to be able to move aside of, oh, you're different because of this and say, well, we both live here in this community. We both share this planet. Let's work together to make it better. So those are the three benefits. It has a global impact. It has an impact on your community. And personally, your perspective shifts when you travel usually. I don't know anyone who stays mentally the same once they've gone to other countries and seen that we take a lot of things for granted, like even Wi-Fi, yes. even clean water. <laughs> We do. And it, it helps you embrace the differences because as Americans, sometimes that's one of the biggest issues. We don't tend to embrace the differences. Like one of my friends from college, we became friends because um, people were like picking on her because she was from um, Dominica. And I'm intrigued because I love to travel. I like different things. So I was intrigued that she was from the Caribbean and not necessarily, you know, like, American, like nothing against Americans, so to speak, because I'm American, but I like the differences and that's how we became friends. So I could see that even when my kids are in the playground and if they see a um, Hispanic kid and they say, hola, the kid lights up, like they, they stop in their tracks like, oh my God, someone like it's automatically like they accept me. Like, it's so crazy. So I can understand, like, doing the sign language or speaking the Spanish. It not only helps your child make a friend, but that child feels welcome and accepted in a world that's not necessarily making them feel like that on a daily basis. So I, I love that. I, I got love two things based off of what you just said. One of them is going to embarrass my mom, but mom, I love you. Um, I said I grew up in an abusive household. It was not my mom. Okay, my mom is amazing. She 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 got four amazing kids. Me and my siblings, 
we are amazing like because of my mom and the village that prayed for us and that that supported us so even though there are toxic family members that are that are close by we still had good soul still and so mom i'm sorry for embarrassing you but my mom just went to the dominican republic and la república dominicana and i was so embarrassed because she told me right before she was going and she said oh um, I'm going to be out of the country for a few days. I was like, out of the country? Where are you going? And then she said, she told me where she was going. And I was like, I'm really offended. You didn't ask me to teach you no, like, no Spanish, like, no, no emergency Spanish, no nothing. You didn't ask me. Because now I want one does the same over there. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she said the day she got there, she didn't realize that they spoke Spanish because every time she met a Dominican, they were always speaking English. But we as specifically black people we code switch all the time so she was acknowledging that she's only met people who were code switching but they're they weren't using their first language whereas we as black people we code switch to make ourselves sound smarter to fit in so we don't get fired so we don't get fined so we don't stand out but we weren't born to fit into a cookie cutter other c word mold Society, yeah, let's go with society. We weren't supposed to fit into a society that was basic. We were meant to be bold. That's why I really love the word negrita. When I was in Southern Spain, I was uh, studying abroad at a um, university in La Uca, La Universidad de Cádiz, and it's in Southern Spain in Andalusia. And it, I was the only American to ever hold this position because I was working with the disabilities office and I translated all of their documents to English. And I think that that was an amazing experience in and of itself Mm -hmm. because they offered me a position. Lord, if if my husband was like the guy who's my husband, if he was not over here in America, I would not be here right now. (laughs) I came back for love. It was worth it. But (laughs) <laughs> they offered me this position and I was so excited because I'm learning how to type on a Spanish keyboard. And it's like similar to ours, but it's different. So ours for command B is bold. For um for in the Spanish keyboard is command N, the letter N or a cop uh, control N, um, the letter N. And I was like, what does N stand for? And they said negrita. Negrita means bold. Negro, think about it. If they they call us Negroes, uh huh, they call us Negroes because that's Latin for black. And then if it's feminine in Spanish, it's negra. But I'm short, so I say negrita because I'm a short little lady. Like I'm five one, so I'm a bold <laughs> little lady, and I take that as an and like yeah, and what they meant to, um, how do you, what they meant in a way to bully us. It is now a sense of empowerment. Like, I'm, gosh, you've been calling me bold this whole time. You might be saying <laughs> Negro, but baby, <laughs> you can't, you can never. <laughs> like, I mean, you, you don't really stand out. And I like the ability to stand out because standing out allows other people to see the light that God has in me and allows them to connect. Because I was in the dark for such a long time. And meeting my husband allowed me to see the light that God had like in me. And it allowed me to break out of the darkness of depression. And that was meeting my husband and learning the languages and being able to make friends. And that's why I love these languages, because it allows me to feel safe and it allows me to help other people feel safe. So like you said, your kids help other people light up when they're on the playground. They, they say hola. It's because they can feel safe once they hear that word. <laughs> which is very important. I teach the safe environment, creating a safe space for your kids. Even like you said, in your home, you need a safe space and a yes environment. Not everywhere is a yes environment because the kids will take it overboard. But that safe space space is very important, everyone. And I love that the language and your husband helped that. So that leads me into, um, I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about it, that leads me into your book. So tell us about your book, because you're an author as well. So tell us about your book. Okay, so the name of my book, I didn't bring a copy because, well, I wasn't sure if it would be age appropriate because it's not about homeschooling. Um, My business has three services. 
the the first service is I work with business owners who are diverse, who are black, who are women, who are deaf. I have blind um, business owners and we are building a network. And it's like Angie's List, but like um, diverse. Okay. I'm, like I'm not, so this, this is our community. It's building a, a community where we can feel safe because everyone else has made it clear that we're not a priority but no one understands the black experience like a deaf person no one understands the black experience like a spanish-speaking person and so this supporting business owners that are specifically that they can advertise for their business in our community online on my website is nsrllc.biz and it'll direct it to the full name, but it'll get you there. And business owners can register their business. And the money that I get from that, I help the um, young ladies um, become their best net selves. So uh, okay. it's a I become their partner, an accountability partner on steroids. Um, the the real name of it is I'm a pimp. I'm a personal improvement and motivation partner. Um, okay. So my Benji. book is related <laughs> to this. It's the tech uh, the tech book for this program. It's about time management. It's, I talk about my trauma or my traumatic experiences and how I use them to keep me moving forward instead, instead of keeping me in the bed in the dark and like keeping me from my purpose because I have too much to be grateful for, for me to be depressed at this point. Like I, I've already gone through that. I don't want to go back. And so that's why I wake up happy and I want to help other young ladies wake up happy. So this is completely free because of those business owners who want to build a community, a community within our global society. And then the other thing I do is the homeschooling, working with other parents, because some of the parents, they, well, a lot of the parents, they have jobs, their kids go to traditional school and then after school or on their breaks or on the weekends is when we meet. So I can teach them how to play these games with their kids and I give them the resources so that they can learn the languages. I want them to feel confident when they walk up to a person who uses sign language or Spanish or French or even German. Like these tools that they learn aren't limited to the languages I know. The only limit is whatever you choose to stop, whatever language you choose to stop learning. Yeah, that that is true. I asked about your book because even though we talk about play-based activities for moms at home, there's that other aspect of getting out the bed, not feeling like doing certain things, being depressed, because as we said, homeschooling is hard and being a mom is hard. Um, So that's why I wanted to touch on your book because I looked at it briefly on um, Amazon and I felt like that was something that my audience will probably be able to relate to, um, especially with you being a mom. And I love that you've incorporated the aspect of young women and helping them um, go into this journey of starting their adulthood and understand that they're not alone and they have an accountability partner. Um, so I love that. So that's why I asked because it, it doesn't relate to play-based and homeschooling, but it relates to the moms at home that may be feeling a certain type of way and may need a resource. So that's why I asked about it. So um, and homeschooling is like, it's not limited to kids. And a lot of us limit the idea of school to I graduated. I'm done. Whereas we always have to continue learning. I and I never call myself fluent in in any of the languages I use because I don't miss an opportunity to learn. I mm -hmm. learn from natives in every conversation, and if I don't, I have to. I have to find something. You gotta teach me something, yes. and that's what I teach with the homeschool thing. Like I gotta navigate this conversation to something that I um I can learn from because you know so much that you use on a regular basis and you take for granted. But what I need from you is how do I improve my skills so that the next time I meet someone, I sound a little bit more sophisticated. This weekend I met someone and I was speaking Spanish to them and they were like, wow, you speak really formal Spanish. And I was like, well, I, I learned in the classroom, but uh, the opposite of formal Spanish is like, what they call kitchen Spanish. And so I worked in a Mexican restaurant and that was the best experience. Like the, the pay was awful, but 
working there <laughs> as a nerd, like I'm a nerd at the end of the day. And I mean, I don't mean that in fact, I was an IB, I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> so um, I absolutely love it. Um, I honestly have to go to, but I do want to talk about a couple more things. Um, so these are just essential things for the new parent who's starting out with homeschooling and homeschool starts from birth. The earliest you start yes. homeschooling, the best. Uh, well, the better your results will be. So the first thing you need is a planner just to document what we talked about for that day and um, what you like, what we what activities we did. How did your kid respond? Did they like it? Were they engaged? Will we try it again? Was it too hard? So I keep this so that I can take notes for myself for later. And then I this is the curriculum. I call it a, um, it's Afrocentric multilingual Montessori inspired timeless curriculum. So I wrote this cu uh, curriculum and it ages with her. So every year we update it before her birthday, just like kids who have an IEP meeting, they go to the meetings and they discuss what goals are we going to be working on. Mm -hmm. So these are all of her classes. We have, we even have a mascot, our school mascot, our homeschool mascot is a unicorn. We just got a, a pet. It's a, a, a class pet, a turtle. Um, but like we talk about it. different things. Um, we have an ideal schedule. She has affirmations. She uh, talks about her allergies in her homeschool because health and teaching a holistic, a holistic approach is the most important part of this. Um, so the agenda, the um, defining what are you teaching this year? This, um, these are important. Like I want her to be able to read before her birthday, at least read something even if it's small sight words and she's showing a lot of improvement the way she um is inspired to read because a lot of kids prefer screen time um is she has to pay for screen time and so she ah. gets these little coins she gets these every anytime she reads a book so she'll get more money to read a book but if she um if she goes to the bathroom by herself she gets paid for that but if she has an accident I don't charge her in that moment. We talk about it first and then she pays me. And I never go in and take her money. She has to pay me because I want her to feel the the pain of what it feels like when you go to the cash register and you got to give them your money because of something you could have fixed yeah. when it's your mistake. But she loves using her money as a tool to buy some, she'll buy screen time on YouTube. I already picked her YouTube kids to, it's, it's basically a classroom. Like, <laughs> Uh, is she only has a limited amount of things she can watch is either in Spanish or is teaching her something or it's in German or French or Italian. So um, here are like, that's one of the most important tools for our homeschool. Um, she can get money for learning how uh, doing math for any of her classwork, science, doing art, like anything academic, she gets money for and taking care of her health. She gets money for that. Anything oh. extra that a lot of parents like, oh no, screen time is back. My baby earned it. She paid for it. It caught, I'll raise the price on it. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> against screen time. People think that I am because it's play-based. I'm not against screen time because that's going to be their world in the future. So they need to know how to navigate it. Exactly. And then this is my newest um, favorite thing. Oh my gosh. So every week we pick two letters. So I got these from a puzzle from Melissa and Doug. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has all of the ABCs. She easily did that because when she was a baby, one of my students, her mom told me to just sing the ABCs as a lullaby. So every day she was hearing the ABCs growing up. And so now at two years old, she'll pick out a letter. She knows automatically where it goes. That got boring. So she'll pick a letter. And then these are ABCs of financial literacy. This is by okay. Cash Flow Kid, and I okay. absolutely love it. So if she picks the letter F, our word for the week is, I can't pronounce this, I ain't gonna lie. And then they about to kick me out. So the okay. word for C is credit score. So I absolutely love making sure that money is a part of her curriculum now so she doesn't grow up with a lack mindset. So that is easier. But I'm so sorry, I do have to go. I would love to continue this conversation with you one day. Okay, we will. One more question. Can we buy yes, the Can moms get the curriculum that you just showed us? Or is that our curriculum? Our curriculum is custom. And so okay. to get it, 
um, you can go to my website on nsrllc.b, as in boy, I, Z. And when you go to my website, you click the I am a parent and either me or one of my staff members will contact you so that we can set up a meeting to have a conversation about what you want to add to your homeschool curricula. This is specifically before they get to preschool because by the time they get to preschool, you will have missed out on learning 75% in their brains. Like their brain will have already developed by that much. So you might as well maximize from birth. That's why I focus on under five. But thank you so much, NS, for this interview. We appreciate you sharing the gems and why multilingual will change the multilingual kids will change the world and make a great impact. Thank you again for having us. Until next time on Let Kids Play. Bye. Bye. Thank you.